two carbons share a double bond. We're not going to worry about naming them. We would just call that an alkene functional group. If there's a triple bond, then it's an alkyne. Alkyne then, see this one again, it's got four carbons. Those middle pair share a triple bond. The only other kind of functional group that's nothing but carbons and hydrogen is the six-membered ring that has that alternating single and double bonds, and that's the aromatic. So I gave you this handout, and you will have this on the exam, okay? So notice in the upper left corner are the first three. So we have alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, and you can recognize alkanes would be nothing but single carbon to carbon bonds, no oxygen, no nitrogen, no sulfur, nothing else, just carbon and hydrogen. But if you see a double bond between two carbons, then that's an alkene, triple bond between two carbons is an alkyne. And then there's the aromatic. So the one that's in the upper right corner on your card, that is that hexagon, right? It's sort of like a cyclohexane look, but notice that it has alternating single and double bonds. They call that an aromatic. Then we went in and we talked about, okay, well, what is it when you see oxygens, okay? And so the examples that I give you, the first one is an alcohol. So an alcohol is a pretty common functional group. It is when a carbon just has an OH, nothing else, just an OH attached to it. So you always have to look at the carbon and see what else is connected. If there's only hydrogens or carbons connected and it's an OH, then you know it's an alcohol. If you have a oxygen with a double bond connected to the end of a chain, then that's considered an aldehyde. Carboxylic acid is always on the end of a chain, but it's where you have two oxygens. One is a double bond oxygen, the other one is an alcohol. The bottom two are what you call if you have any kind of nitrogen. So if you have any kind of nitrogen in a molecule, it's either an amine or an amide. And the way to tell them apart is the amine, if you look at this one, the amine, the nitrogen that it's, the nitrogen, which is here, it is connected to a carbon that doesn't have any other oxygens attached to it. So that would be an amine. Whereas an amide will always have a nitrogen which is attached to a carbon and that carbon has an oxygen attached to it. So if you see a nitrogen, you've got to look at the carbons that are attached to the nitrogen to be able to figure that out. Then the last ones. So the ketone, the ether, and the ester these are when you have oxygen groups in the middle of a chain, not on an end. The ketone is when you have the double bond to oxygen on a carbon in the middle of a chain. But notice that the carbon doesn't have anything else other than carbons attached to it. The ether is when the oxygen is part of the chain. And then an ester is kind of a combination of the two. So an ester is in the middle of the chain, but it's going to be when a carbon has two oxygens attached to it. One is the double bond oxygen, and then that oxygen part of the chain. So you've got to kind of look at when you have oxygens, you've got to find the oxygen and then kind of look at what's around it to try and figure out which one it is. Anytime you see a sulfur, there's that's a thiol. doesn't matter if there's one sulfur. There's examples where there's actually two sulfurs. It's still considered a thiol. And then the last one. So the last one is called a phenol. It looks like the aromatic, so see the hexagon. Okay, so it has the hexagon shape alternating single and double bonds, but it has an alcohol attached to it, which makes it different than just an aromatic. Phenols are much more reactive than aromatics. They're really good disinfectants. And so look, if you see that six-membered ring alternating single and double bonds, you know, always know that it's a either a phenol or an aromatic. You just have to look for the presence of that OH group or the alcohol. So we went through and we did a couple of them, and then I did the big one, okay? So in this big one actually has all of them listed. Now you've got your chart, and I want you to look at this one, okay? So looking at this big molecule, I want you to look at and find functional groups on this molecule. And what I'll tell you, here's the order that I always look for. One, I always look for any sulfurs. If I see any sulfur, then I know it's a thiol, okay? So that's a thiol group. Like that one's easy because it's not, it's always just is. And then two, look for the ring. Look for the hexagon. Now the hexagon has to have alternating single and double bonds. 
If you find a hexagon, then look all around hanging off of that hexagon. If you see an OH, it's a phenol. If you don't, it's an aromatic. Okay, so if I have just the ring, it's an aromatic. But if there's an OH, and it could be an OH off of any of those corners, then that's a phenol. Then the third thing that I look for is look for nitrogen. Because nitrogen is either an amine or an amide. Okay, so if I have a nitrogen... and none of those, none of the carbons connected to the nitrogen have oxygen, then I know that this is an amine. So it might have one carbon connected to it, two carbons connected, it could even have three carbons connected, but if none of those carbons have double bond oxygens, then I know that this is an amine. If even one of them, oh, that's a nitrogen. If even one of them is a carbon with a double bond oxygen, then that, whole part here, this is an amide. So look at your card, can you see that? Like look at the nitrogen to figure out if it's an amine. You look at the carbons connected to the nitrogen, as long as none of the carbons have a double bonded oxygen, it's an amine. If any of them have a double bonded oxygen, then it's an amide. And then the last one. So the last one are the oxygens. And so to pick out the oxygens, look first, do we have oxygens at the end? Okay, so if you see them at the end of a chain, if they are this, what is that? If it's a double bond oxygen and a hydrogen at the end of a chain, that means it's a aldehyde. aldehyde. If you have a double bond oxygen and an OH at the end of a chain, then that's a, nope, that's in the middle. That's a middle one. That carboxylic acid, the one everybody has a hard time saying, car and then box and then illic acid. Okay, but those are always on the end of the chain. You'll never see them in the middle of a molecule. So like I kind of like look around the edges if I see an oxygen hanging off of the end of a chain, it's gonna be one of these. It's either an aldehyde or a carboxylic acid. If they're in the middle of the chain, so that means if I have a carbon, 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 and there's just a single double bond oxygen, then this is the, this is the ketone but it's in the middle of the chain and it would just be a single double bond oxygen. If the oxygen is part of the chain, then that is a, mm -hmm, that's an ether, mm -hmm, ether is fine. However you wanna say it to, to pronounce it's fine. And if it's a combination of those two, then that is an ester. And if it's none of those, if you see just the OH, because this OH could be on an end, could be in the middle, but if it's an OH just connected to a carbon with nothing else, then that's the alcohol. Because that one could be on the end of a chain or it could be in the middle of a chain. You just, it's an OH all by itself, okay? It's connected to a carbon and that carbon doesn't have anything else. Just as nothing but carbons or hydrogens attached. So you look at this one and you tell me. So starting with step one, what do you see? Where? Mm -hmm. Yep, so here's the thiol. So that's what I would name first, okay? Because that one, I know it. There's only one choice, <laughs> only one, one option that's there, okay? So now look at the rings. What do you see? Where? Which one's the aromatic? There's two of, there's three with the rings. The bottom two are both aromatics. Can you see that? So you see the ring of six, ring of six, no OH is on it. Ring of six, no OH is hanging off of it. So both of these are aromatics. But then what about the third one? 
Can you see that? Do you see the ring? But then you see an OH. I see an HO. Uh huh. HOOH, <laughs> either side. <laughs> that makes it a phenol. Okay? All right? So we did the sulfur, we did the hexagons. Now, do you see any nitrogens? Mm -hmm. Okay? So what do you see? Are they amines or amides, or do you know one of each? Yes. So you see this nitrogen. So when you see the nitrogen, look at the carbons connected. So that one's just part of their phenol. This one's part of an aromatic. But look, that one has a double bond oxygen. So if the nitrogen has a double bond oxygen on any carbon connected, this is an amide. This only mm -hmm. next, next Monday night. Okay. Here's the other nitrogen. So do you see a carbon with the double bond oxygen on there? No, so that means this is an amine. So we've named the nitrogens. The last ones are the oxygens. So look for oxygens at the end of a chain. Do you see any? Mm -hmm. Where? At the very top. Mm -hmm. Yep, and this is an aldehyde. Mm -hmm. So like on your note card, you might want to just put like, One's at the end, aldehyde, carboxylic acids. One's in the middle, ketone, ester, and ethers. You're going to have this. So you don't have to put this on your card, but you may have to put a little bit of a description, like where am I going to find, how do I tell, like an aldehyde versus a ketone? Like how do I tell the difference? So you may want to put like a note about that in terms of functional groups, but you will have both of these when you take your test. Okay, so you don't have to put like the structures of these down because you're going to have this. And I actually posted that in Moodle for you. So if you want to like use it as you do, let me see if I can find it. Yes, no, <laughs> it's in here. So if you go to Chem 130 and you go down to exam two, see down at the bottom, there's the chapter four functional groups handout. That's this. So my suggestion is download this on your computer and use it while you do the dynamic study module. There's a dynamic study module for identifying functional groups. So use this, practice using the handout. So next Monday when you take the test, you've kind of already used it to try to find stuff and it's gonna be a little more familiar. Okay? All right, then back. Is that everything? There's a lot, that's the last one. So I was like, so you look through, nothing circled is, everything else that's circled is nothing but carbons. There's one oxygen, do you see this one? An oxygen in a chain. The oxygen in the chain is? Mm -hmm. So do you see that? That's when you have an oxygen that's part of the chain. So it'd be like carbon, oxygen, carbon. Not one sticking up, hanging off like a ketone or an aldehyde, but it's actually part of the chain. Okay, so here's one more, just because we didn't really have the card to practice with last time. So what's the first thing you're going to look for? Do you see one? No. No, so no sulfur. So second thing you're going to look for? The rings, okay? So there's two rings. Mm -hmm. The top one is the phenol. Everybody see that with the OH? And then this one then is a aromatic. Okay, so that's the rings. What's the third thing to look for? Nitrogens, okay? So do you see any nitrogens? Okay, what do you see? Okay, so this one. So when you look at that one, what is that? Um, mm -hmm. It's an amine because do you notice the carbon it's connected to just has a hydrogen, doesn't have any oxygen, so this is an amine. Keep looking, do you see any others? Uh-huh, and so this one, what is it? Is it an amine or an amide? Because look at the carbon to the left, do you see the double bond oxygen? Okay, so the carbon might be on the left or the right or above or below. Just look at all the carbons connected to the nitrogen. If any of them have a double bond oxygen, then that means this whole thing is an amide. All 
All right, now, let's see. What was the next thing? <laughs> oh, oxygen's at the end, right? So oxygen's at the end is the next ones to find. That's a carboxylic acid right there. Right here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is a carboxylic acid. Mm -hmm. Find another oxygen sticking off an end. What's that one? Where? Right here. Up or down? Going that way. Going, are you talking about this oxygen? Uh, no, not. What's that one? It's just an OH. Alcohol. It's just an alcohol. Mm -hmm. So alcohol is an OH on that carbon and nothing else. It doesn't have any other oxygens or nitrogens, nothing else on it. So all those in the middle there, those are all carbon, carbon, carbon. What else? Oxygen's at the end. What about this end? What? What's that? Nope. Ketones are in the middle. Um, so mm -hmm. this, the this is an aldehyde. Yep. Okay. I got confused with that one right there. What CH2 is. CH2. In the middle over here too. Are you talking about this one? No. Oh, are you talking about this one? Yeah. Okay, so what's that? Is that the ketone? Mm -mm. This is an ester. All right, so when you find an oxygen, kind of look at what other things are around it. Do you see that this is one? This pen's going to drive me insane. Do you see that? This entire piece. So when you see, if you see an oxygen, Kind of like look at the carbons it's attached to. What else is going on? Do they have anything else? So that one, I look at the carbon that oxygen's attached to and see that it's got a double bond oxygen. So that together makes a an ester. This one, notice when you look on opposite sides, they're just carbons, right? So above and below, those are just carbons attached. So this is a ether. Mm -hmm. No more oxygens, no more oxygens. What would that be? Double bond carbon. Mm -hmm. This is an al. A pen. <laughs> I'm writing like a crazy person. This is actually an alkene. Do you see that one up in the upper corner? A L K. E N E. Remember, alkanes are all the single bonds, but that's just a double bond between two carbons, nothing else about it. That's an alkene. So there is a dynamic study module that doesn't give you humongous molecules like this. It just gives you like one molecule and asks you one fi functional group, but use that handout, download the handout in Moodle and use it to help you go through and answer them because that's going to be a good way of practicing using the handout so that when you have it, you can pick these ones out. All right, so then the last topic. So the last topic in this chapter is all about isomers. So we have to talk about conformational isomers, structural isomers, stereoisomers, and then enantiomers. So all four of those groups are called isomers as like a major group. And this is when you have two or more atoms, sorry, <laughs> two or more molecules, with the same molecular formula. It's so the one that we did in lab was using four carbons. So this molecule, which is what? What would you call this if you had to name it? A straight chain with four carbons is butane. Mm -hmm. So remember, one would be methane, two is ethane, three is propane, four is butane. Right? So that's just the name of the longest chain. So that's all that it is, nothing but carbons and hydrogen. And so do you notice that this is four carbons, so C4, and then there's a hydrogen up and a hydrogen down for each one and one on either end. So for a straight chain hydrocarbon, the number of hydrogens is always going to be twice as many carbons plus two because there's one above, one below, and then the ones on the end. So this is H10. 
So C4H10. But if I have the same molecule or the same formula, I can actually arrange these so that there is a different connectivity between the atoms. So this is not really the same, but do you see that when you look at the total numbers, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hydrogens there as well. So this is still C4H10. So if you have two molecules with the same number of carbons and hydrogens, then they are called isomers. But I can define these more descript more sort of specifically. They are either going to be structural isomers or conformational isomers. What I just drew is actually a structural isomer. Structural isomers is when you have two or more molecules with the same formula, but they're put together differently. So they're going to have different names. And that is really like the big, the big thing to remember. You can tell a structural isomer from a conformational isomer by naming them. If they have the same name, I know they're conformational isomers. If they have different names, then they're structural isomers. So we said that this first one right here, so this is C4H10. So this one, four carbons in a row, we said that this is butane. But the one next to it has three carbons in a row and then a carbon hanging off of the middle. So that, what's the longest carbon chain? This is called what? Propane. Mm -hmm. So the longest carbon chain is three. That's a propane. And then this group hanging off of the protein, propane, a single carbon group hanging off is a, a methyl. Mm -hmm. So this is 2-methylpropane. So when I name these, I get two different names. That is how I know that they're called structural isomers. They're actually different molecules just put together differently. But remember when we looked at butane, you could put your butane together and like flip it around, flip it around so it looked like a zigzag, or you could flip it around and make it look more like a little boat or a U shape. So those... This one right here, everybody agrees that this is butane. But when you look at the one on the right, do you see that I can go three across and one up, that this is actually the longest continuous chain? It's drawn differently, but it's still butane. So notice their skeletal structure. They have their zigzag skeletal structure where they have this sort of bent shape, is what we called it, where it kind of forms like a little U type of shape. I could also draw this and go one, two, three, or I could even go like that. Do you see that all of those would be butane? They might look different, but if I go about naming them, they're still all exactly the same. They're the same molecule, and that is how you tell a structural isomer from a conformational isomer. So one, you always want to check the number of atoms. You have to have the same numbers of carbons and hydrogens. If you have the same numbers of carbons and hydrogens, then you know they're isomers. So then you name them. If they have the same name, conformational isomers. Different name, structural isomers. So let's look at these. First one, you tell me how many carbons. Five, so this is a pentane. Right? Remember that that's a chain of five carbons, pent. And the, from pent going up, they're easier because they just follow the geometric shape. So pentagon, hex, then heptane, hexane, heptane, octane. So they follow their normal rules. But then when I look at this second one, how many carbons? So one, two, three, four, five. This is C5. And I have H12. Twice as many hydrogens as carbon plus two, those ones on the ends. When I look at the next one to figure out, I go one, two, three, four, oh, five carbons. And if you count the number of hydrogens, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, same. So I know those have to be isomers. So what do you think? Are they the same molecule or are they different? They're the same. So are they both pentane? Yes. 
What is how many? What's the longest carbon chain for that one? It's only four, so it can't be a pentane. It's a butane. So when you're looking to figure this out, you've got to look at how they're connected. So I have this is a methyl. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's hanging off, and it's hanging off a carbon number two because you would start numbering from that left side. Pentane, two methyl butane. Those are structural isomers. They have the same number of carbons and hydrogens, but they're put together differently. So how many carbons in the last one? Five. How many hydrogens? Twelve. So I know that they have to be an isomer of the other two. Are they put together the same or differently? If they're put together differently, this one would be 2,2-dimethylpropane because two methyls are hanging off of the middle. These, oh, I thought it was me. <laughs> this is going to be another structural isomer. So this one would be 2,2-dimethylpropane. Right? Two methyls hanging off of a three-carbon chain. But because they have the same formula, different names, they are all structural isomers of each other. For naming, it would still be the same name, yeah? Because it would still be three in a row, that's the longest chain. And each of them would have two methyls hanging off of the middle carbon, so they would both be 2,2-dimethyl. So let's look at these ones at the bottom. So at the bottom, I have one, two, three, four carbons. So C4, how many hydrogens in that first one? Eight. Mm -hmm. And then I also have a bromine and a chlorine, right? So that would be like the formula, uh, the number of carbons, number of hydrogens, and then any of those halogens. What about the one over on the right? How many carbons? Four. How many hydrogens? Still eight. Mm -hmm. And then you see the bromine and a chlorine. So I know they're isomers. They have the same number of atoms. That's the first criteria. Like, just count how many of each. If they don't have the same number of atoms, then you can just say they're not related. You don't have to go any further. They have to have the same number of atoms in order to be isomers. So now this one was the longest carbon chain in the first one. Four. So that makes this a butane. Mm -hmm. The bromine is a bromo, right? The chlorine becomes a chloro. Now numbering, which way am I going to number? From the left or the right, or does it matter? From the left, because that's where the bromine is, right? So this would be one bromo, and the chlorine would be on carbon number three. So then look at the other one. So the other one, longest carbon chain is... Four. Can you see this? Mm -hmm. So see that I can go down to have four. So that makes this also a butane. This is a bromo. And this is a chloro. So the bromine would have what number? Mm -hmm. And the chlorine would be a... So do you see that they are the same? So sometimes when you first look at them, you might be like, they're not the same. They're put together differently. So naming them, like the ones at the top, I think you could tell that they were different. Because you could tell five in a row, four in a row, one down. Three in a row, one up, one down. They look different. But if it's ones where you're not 100% sure, just name them. When you name these, these are both 1-bromo-3-chlorobutane. So these are conformational isomers. So I might give you a pair of molecules and ask you, how are these related? If they don't have the same formula, then you can say they're not related. If they have the same name and they're isomers, then they're conformational isomers. If they're put together differently and have different names, then they're structural isomers. Oh, how to name it? 
Right, so like this could be, this is the longest carbon chain. Do you see that three? So that makes it a propane. So then this group up is a methyl, and this group down is a methyl. So they're both hanging off carbon number two. So that's why you would have two comma two, and then they put that dimethyl because there's two of them. It's a little redundant, but that's fine. Because <laughs> two, two and dimethyl, like I think the two, two tells me there's two of them, but I didn't make the IUPAC naming rules. But that's how they would come up with that. But see how those three, all different names, structural isomers. These two, same name, look different, but they're the same name. So those are conformational isomers. So now, skip this one. You tell me this one at the top. First thing I want you to do is count the number of carbons. Tell me the formula. Remember, every dot is going to be a carbon. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I got eight. I got eight. Okay. So how many hydrogens? This one on the end would be a what? Carbon on the end. It's got one bond to another carbon, so then it has to have four bonds. So how many hydrogens would it have to have? Mm -hmm. So this would be a CH3. What about the one just up from it? That would be a CH2. So do you see why? It's got two lines connected to it. That's two of its bonds. It has to have two hydrogens to make four. Carbon has to have four bonds. So the end carbons are always CH3s. Because they got one bond to a carbon and three hydrogens to make their four. The next carbon's a CH2. What's the next one in the zigzag? That is, it's got one, two, three lines connected. So to make four, it's got to have one hydrogen. So this is going to be a CH. What about the one hanging down? What is this one? Mm -hmm. This is a CH3. So if it only has one line attached, it has to be a CH3. If it has two lines attached, it'll be a CH2. Three lines attached means it's a CH. And if it has four lines attached, it has no hydrogens. Okay? Because four kind of combinations in any way, carbon's got to have four bonds. So going up, up past the CH, what's this one? Mm -hmm. And then down here, and this one, has three lines connected, so it's got to have, it's got to be a CH. And then the last one, CH3. Right? Because you tell yourself in your head, think, okay, carbon always has a bond up, a bond down, a bond left, and a bond right. So if two bonds are connected to carbon, these ones got to be hydrogens. Right? If I only have one bond to another carbon, then those three have to be hydrogens. Because I have to have that total of four. So that's how you can, like, Take a skeletal structure and figure out like how many hydrogens are connected. So now we got to count them though. <laughs> so three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. I got seventeen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. So H seventeen, and then also a Br. Okay, so let's look at the one over on the other side. Tell me how many carbons does that one have? Nine. So you can stop right there and say, these are not related. <laughs> they do not have the same number of carbons. Nope, they're not related. They're not isomers at all. Because one has, nope, they're not conformational either. They're, they are like not isomers at all. So in the scheme of things, the only way they can be isomers, they have to have the same formula. The formulas have to match. Do you see that one has eight, one has nine? So we just put not related. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that's why you always look at the formula first. Because if one has five carbons, the other has six carbons, not related, you don't even have to answer anything else. But if they both had eight carbons, 17 hydrogens, and one bromine, then they're isomers. And then you're trying to figure out, are they the same molecule drawn differently? because they'll have the same name, or are they molecules that are put together differently, in which case they'll have different names. So that help a little bit. The next one. So the next one are what they call the cis and trans stereoisomers. So this is the third kind of isomer. Stereoisomers, you will only have to worry about naming from a ring. 
So in this one, in this diagram that they've got right here, this ring of five, what do you call that? But when it's a ring, what do you put in front of pentane? It's a cyclo, right? Anytime you see cyclo, remember that's a ring. Cyclopentane, ring of five, okay? Cyclohexane, ring of six. If you see hexane, make sure you check the word in front. Make sure it's not a cyclo, because cyclo, you want to turn it into a ring. So that's a cyclopentane. When five carbons form into this ring, that stops their rotation. So remember when it's a long straight change, you remember in lab, you could like twist those molecules. You could take and twist it so it bends up. You could make it into this nice little zigzag. You could bend it so it bends down. When you have all single bonds and not in a ring, you have this free rotation. Once you make the ring, now it like locks the bonds in place. So anything hanging off of the ring is gonna be stuck in its position. So they used two methyl groups. So they have a CH3, a methyl group here, and a CH3 on side-by-side -side carbons. And so in this, and I'm gonna try it, it almost never happens. <laughs> nope. That's not it. <laughs> you know, I did this in class and I couldn't make it not do this. <laughs> it made me so crazy. <laughs> Cause where's the zoom? Arrow options? No. Screen? No. Camera? No. I don't want subtitles. I really need help. <laughs> like in more ways than one. <laughs> nope, it won't let me. So in the last class, it like this zoomed in and you could see these two molecules healed. So you have to like look kind of close. Can you see that one of the methyl groups looks like it's kind of pointing up and the other methyl group looks like it's kind of pointing down here? So remember those rings. So if I'm holding the ring and looking at the ring, one group's gonna be pointing towards me in that way with the little wedge the other one looks like it's actually sticking away from me, and that's why they use the dash, dash, dash. When they have this arrangement, no matter what I do to the ring, even if I flip the ring over, they're still gonna be on opposite sides of the ring because the ring stops them from being able to rotate. So when that happens, you will see a wedge and a dash that is used to show the hanging group, the non-hydrogen hanging group, and they call that the trans stereoisomer. Because tra trans, I always think of it, it means across. They're on opposite sides of one another. So you'll always see it with the wedge, with, with the wedge and the dash. Okay, so trans will always have a ring structure with one wedge and one dash to the non-hydrogen group. But the other one, when you look at it, can you see that it looks like it's methyl group? They both point down. So in this, when I'm holding on to it, they're either both pointing at me, or if I flip it around, they're both pointing away. And I cannot twist the ring to make one go one direction, one go the other. The only way I could do that, I'd have to break the bonds and rearrange them. So this, the skeletal structure, is that little five-membered ring still a cyclopentane? But it'll have either two wedges or two dashes. So they're either gonna both look like they're pointing at you or they're both gonna point away. And remember this is called cis. So you can think of these, they're the same. They're the same wedges or the same dashes, that's cis. So cis has the same symbol. I always think of cis is on the same side. So the S's, I kind of like the sound of it, helps me to remember cis. And then when I think of trans, I always think of things being across. They're on opposite sides of each other. So that is where you end up with one wedge and one dash on the non-hydrogen groups. Now, if I had something like this, you don't name that cis and trans because there's only one. You only use cis and trans if there's two. Because if there's one, it could be pointing at me and if I flip it away, it's pointing away. But it's not in combination. You're not, you only use cis and trans if you have two hanging groups on a ring. Then you identify them as which way are they going. And they have to be on different carbons. So if I had like 
<clears throat> if I had this, so if I had a cyclopentane with two methyls on the same carbon, well, clearly one will be one way and one will be the other way. I can't put them both on the same side just because of what happens when you make the ring. When you make the ring, one sticks this way and one sticks that way off of every carbon. It would only be if they were on different carbons, and that's really what you look for. Look for two wedges or two dashes, that's cis. Or look for a wedge and a dash, and that's going to be trans. So there, are they trying to show you like the one sticking up would be the wedge, the one sticking down would be the dashes, and sort of thinking like drawing them this way. I'll just make sure that I use the wedge and the dash, okay? So you can remember if you see both wedges or both dashes, it's cis. If you see one or the one of each, then you know it's going to be trans. We are going to talk about this in the next chapter. So lipids, fats, and oils can exist with a double bond in long carbon chains. In nature, they always exist in the cis formation. So do you notice in the cis formation, like the chain, kind of both of its bonds going up to the carbon stick up? They're like on the same side of the double bond. But notice that trans is on the opposite side. So when you take an hydrogenate fat, you can actually create what they call trans fats. Maybe you've heard about them. They banned them. They've actually been out of production and not available since 2020. One, because of the negative health effects that they actually have. So we talk about cis and trans. We'll talk about them again in the next chapter, too. So the last thing. So the last one are what are called enantiomers. So we have conformational isomers, structural isomers, stereoisomers, just the rings, okay, where you have two. But then we have what they're called enantiomers. This is the fourth kind of isomer. This is when you have molecules that are, they have the same formula. In fact, their bonds are put together exactly the same. So in that way, they're a lot like a stereoisomer. But it's unique because of certain carbon atoms in the molecule create non-superimposable mirror images. And their one example is kind of cool. So limonene is a molecule that when you smell this, this gives you the smell of like a freshly peeled orange. You know how like orange peel, like right when you peel it, that like it's this real strong, bright orange smell. It's really a nice smell. Your receptors in your nasal passages detect that molecule and your brain goes, oh, that's a freshly peeled orange smell. The other one is turpentine. Have you ever used turpentine? Mm -hmm. Turpentine is like paint stripper. Like, it's what you can use to strip um, the coating off of wood. But they use it for medicine. It's really turpentine? Yeah, turpentine is an old school remedy. Turpentine was made for colds. Oh, I just Are you talking about something like that you would, in, like, I'm like, about like, like, but not drink? Yes. I'm going to have to do some research on that one. Hmm? Yeah, that's the old school. My grandma don't use it like, downtown. We, at, that, at that drug store down here, mm -hmm. downtown, the Rock and Mountain, don't sell it no more. Yes, um, I can imagine why. I'm like, but, 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 <laughs> it's, it's for, probably carcinogenic. <laughs> yeah, but it was for the flu and uh -huh. stuff like that. Turpentine. I'm kidding you not. Huh. I was thinking maybe you were thinking about like like the menthol kind of like aromas and stuff. Like that a lot of people use, you know, like the Vicks vapor rub, you'd rub it on your chest because it would help like Loosen help you to inhale it. Right. Well that actually causes some some bronchodilation, so it helps to open up airways. So I'll have to do a little research on turpentine. But turpentine to me is a very strong smelling, like it's a solvent that you use if you're trying to strip like old varnish off of wood. And so when you use this, you're supposed to have it like so that your house is ventilated. You're supposed to have a fan to make sure that you keep it out. So they're very different because like you smell that a whole lot. That'll make you high. <laughs> That's why I was like, hmm. <laughs> so very different in terms of their effects. But they, if you look at them, the molecules look almost identical. In fact, the only difference between these two molecules is that they look like mirror images of each other. So if I took this, do you notice that one has the wedge, wedge, wedge just below the ring? The other one has the dash, okay? So there's the wedge on the right, the dash structures on the left. That's the only difference between them. So they're really like right-hand version or mirror images of each other. 
So what makes these special, and they kind of blow that one up just a little bit, what makes these special is truly because of the carbon that it is in that molecule. So by definition, an enantiomer is always going to have what's called a chiral carbon. And the word chiral means hand. And so I know everybody pronounces it chiral, and that's fine if you want to, see, you can pronounce it chiral. So it's chiral is its actual name, but this is when you have a molecule that has a carbon. And the kicker is, is the carbon has to have four single bonds in all the groups are different, okay? So that's really the big kicker, is they have to be different. So when looking at this one down at the bottom, this one shows that up here at the top, there's a carbon with an OH, that's the blue. It might be hard to see, so I'll just rewrite it. Over on the left, the H is the gray ball. The green one over on the right is a CH3. And then the group hanging down is a CH2, CH3 group. So when you look at this, the, in each group above, below, left, and right, they're all different. So it's not just the atom next to that carbon, but the entire group to the left, right, above, and below. Those are all different. So when I make the mirror image of this molecule, do you see that I cannot match up the four groups? So do you notice, and we did this in labs, so you notice like when you try to lay those two molecules on top of each other, the mirror images do not match up. So notice like the OH, the blue balls match up and the red areas match up, the CH2, CH3s, but notice that the green and the gray don't. So the green and the gray are swapped from what they should be. So in fact, these are not exactly the same molecules they are called non-superimposable mirror images. That's what enantiomers are. The only time you're gonna see an enantiomer is if you have a chiral carbon. So finding chiral carbons, if you can find even one chiral carbon, then you know that that molecule can exist as a mirror image that's not the same exact molecule. So you just look for carbons. One thing you can throw out, any carbons with a double bond or a triple bond cannot be chiral. They have to all be single bonds. So you've got to see carbons with four single bonds. So if you see a carbon with a double bond, then you know it can't be chiral. If you see a carbon with a triple bond, you know it can't be chiral. They have to have four single bonds the second thing, look at how many hydrogens are directly connected to the carbon. Because most of the ones we've been talking about in class, they're like CH3, CH2. If you see a CH3, you know it can't be chiral because it's got three hydrogens. They're not all three different group, four different groups. If you see a CH2, you know that it can't be chiral. So if your carbon has a hydrogen, more than one hydrogen directly connected to it, then you know that it can't be chiral. And that honestly knocks out most of them because that's what the majority of your carbons, when you look at an organic molecule, they have two or three hydrogens. So the only way that you can find a chiral carbon is the group above, below, left, and right have to be different. And they like to use a little asterisk, so they'll use like a little star next to it if you have to identify it. So let's just practice, okay? So looking at these, there's four carbons in this molecule. Looking at the first carbon up in the upper left, this is butane, are there any chiral carbons in butane? Okay, so look at the first one. Does the first one have four different groups? Does this carbon have four different groups? No, it's got three hydrogens, okay? What about the second carbon? No, it's got two hydrogens. What about the third? No. Nope, it's got two hydrogens. What about the fourth? No. no. So you would say none. In fact, for methane, ethane, propane, butane, hexane, they're never going to be chiral, okay? Because they always, all those hydrogens 
They're never going, if you make the mirror image of butane, you can lay them right on top of each other. They're exactly the same, okay? Let's look at the one that's over to the right. So the one over to the right, so look at the left carbon and you tell me, is this chiral? No. Okay, what about the one on the far right? No. Okay, now we're looking at the middle one. So the yeah. middle one only has one hydrogen. So that's, a, oh, only one hydrogen. Do you see that there's only one hydrogen directly connected? Above is an OH. So do you agree those two are different? Yeah. OH above and hydrogen below. To the right is a what? What's that whole molecule called? That's a CH3. To the left is a, so is that chiral? No, because they both have CH, they're two the same. So two CH3s, so this has none as well. So do you see that? I'm not looking at just what's connected right next to it. Look at everything above, below, left, and right. So let's look at the one that's long. So this one, this carbon right here, is it chiral or no? CH2OH. No, because it's CH2, right? So I know that there's two hydrogens, so I know that can't be. What about the next carbon? Why? It has a double bond. Remember we said double bonds and triple bonds. The car carbon cannot be, so this one's a no. Now let's look at this one. I'll change colors so maybe you can see them better. This one, I have on the right is an OH, on the left is an H. Going up is this whole group, going down is this whole group. Are they different? So how many hydrogens on the group above? One, two, three, and then below? One, two, three, four, five. So they're definitely different, right? They don't have the same number of atoms on above and below. So yes, this is a chiral carbon. All, everything above, below, left, and right are different. Okay, let's look at the next carbon down. What do you think? It's that red one. Is that chiral? So here's the right, an H. Here's the left, an OH. Below is a one carbon. Above is a three carbon group. So are those all different? Yes. Yeah. So that one's chiral too. And then, look. what about the last one down at the very bottom? CH2OH. No, why? Because CH2. Anytime you see CH2 or CH3, just exit off and move on. If you see a hydrogen, more than one hydrogen directly connected, just cross it off and move on. Okay? So this is a no. Everybody understands that's got two hydrogens directly connected, just like the top one did. So they can't be chiral. The second carbon in that, in that chain can't be chiral because it's got a double bond oxygen. Okay? So let's look at this one. So we got four carbons, and so you're looking like at each one. Okay, what about this one? Why? It's a CH3. Okay, so if you, oh, if you see CH2s or CH3s, throw them out. So that means, which other one can I throw out? The one on the other end. Do you see this? So this is a no, and this is a no. I can be sure of those because they're both CH3s. Now just the middle two. So this carbon has a hydrogen, this is one, two, three, and then that whole group over there would make four. Are those all different? A CH3, an OH, an H, and then a CH2, a CH, CH3, OH. Like everything to the right, to the left, below, and that hydrogen would really be sticking up. It's just done in a, are those all different? Yeah. So that one is a yes. That is chiral. So what about the one next to it? This one. Mm -hmm. It has a hydrogen, has an alcohol, it has a single carbon, and then it has a two carbon group on the other side. So that's a yes. So there is a dynamic study module like trying to pick these out. So they'll give you like three and four carbons in a molecule and have you go through and just use those rules. 
Okay, so the first rule, if there's more than one hydrogen directly connected, just throw it out. Second rule, if there's any double bonds or triple bonds, throw those out. And that usually just leaves the few to look at. So then you don't have quite as many. So the last topic is, so what do chiral carbons have to do with anything? Well, one, we're going to talk about chiral carbons because sugars have lots of chiral carbons, and that's chapter six. So when you think of a chiral carbon, remember, it's sort of like you have a right hand and a left hand version. So these are mirror, just like your hands are mirror images of each other, and you can't lay them on top of each other. I can't make them identical. Even if I flip my hand around, you notice that they're not exactly the same. Then you have a palm in the back of your hand. Well, it's the same thing for, for chemicals that have a chiral carbon. Now I have like a left form and a right form of the molecule. Pharmaceutical companies have to actually check all enantiomers, all mirror images that contain a chiral carbon to see if that medication is helpful, has no effect, or if it's harmful. So this is the ruling by the FDA, and there's a couple of examples. So one, Parkinson's. So Parkinson's disease is characterized by a loss of a chemical in your brain called dopamine. And what dopamine does, dopamine's involved in memory, so Parkinson's patients oftentimes start having dementia issues, having issues with remembering things. It also plays a role in mood. So a lot of times people that have Parkinson's will have like depression and have like mood issues. The big one though, and how that's usually identified, dopamine controls fine motor movements. So if you stop being able to control fine motor, you start to develop a tremor. So you might notice that the person just has like their hand just sort of shakes. Sometimes they develop like a little bit of this head wobble and it's really because the brain can't fine tune the control and so it creates a little more irregular patterns. The problem with Parkinson's is that then you start losing your balance and so you fall down. You go to try to lift your foot and that's, a, that's an issue because of that wobbling that you get. So what they found was there is this carbon right here. So that carbon, notice it's got five lines connected, or sorry, five. It's got three lines connected to it. So how many hydrogens does it have? If it has three lines connected, it needs just one to make its four. So remember that would have a hydrogen on it. And all of those groups are different. Hydrogen up, nitrogen group down, carboxylic acid group to the left, and then a phenol with an extra alcohol on it over to the right. So those groups above, below, left, and right are all different. So they made mirror images of them. So what they found was this chemical, this medication, this is called DOPA. If they gave this patient one form of this medication, it would actually be converted to dopamine in their brain. And these people suddenly started to have fine motor control. They suddenly started being able to interact with you again because as Parkinson's gets worse and worse and worse, you have less and less interaction with the person till eventually they seem like they're almost in a comatose state. So this one side, and we can kind of say like, okay, this is the left-handed side, they call it L. And then this one, this is the right-handed side. They tested the left-handed side and it was actually utilized and helped those patients return to some normal function. The right-handed side had no effect at all. And in fact, they find a lot of medications, a lot of pharmaceuticals that have a chiral carbon. One form ha will have biological activity and one form doesn't, has none at all. Tylenol is another example of this. Tylenol has one single chiral carbon, so there's a right and left-handed form. One side reduces fever, decreases inflammation, alleviates pain, the other side does nothing. I kind of equate it to the sensation like, like so if, if you go to shake hands, like if you shake hands, you always shake hands with your right hand and that like feels normal. Now like put your left hand out and shake my hand, <laughs> right? So that's like, and that's literally what that is, is instead of it being the correct form, it's like this backwards form. And so for the body, the body doesn't recognize that form. So albuterol, 
has a chiral carbon in it. Ibuprofen, naproxen, all have chiral carbons in them. The challenge was, is, and prior to that, they, there was this understanding that one might work, one wouldn't. But in the 1950s, there was a drug that was developed called thalidomide. So this is the drug. And here's his chemical structure and also his little um, ball and stick structure so you can see it. So one challenge early in the first um, trimester is that women have morning sickness. Some women have really bad morning sickness. So we actually have like a, a biology instructor. Like she lost like 25 pounds and she was only like 110 pounds soaking wet to begin with. So she would start throwing up and she couldn't stop. Like it would just get to where she couldn't stop. She'd have to go to the hospital and they'd have to give her some of the meds that they give people for cancer, chemotherapy drugs, to try and get her to stop because she just could not keep anything down at all. So this was great. So doctors were super happy about thalidomide because it meant that women had less morning sickness that they tended to not lose so much weight during that first trimester and that had better outcomes for baby. Okay, so baby ended up being healthier. Well, when they did their clinical trials initially in the 1950s, they actually only, they did not determine the chemical structure of thalidomide and they only produced one enantiomer pair. So thalidomide has a chiral carbon, but they only tested the left-handed version. And the left-handed version was really good at alleviating, alleviating morning sickness. Now this happened in Germany. So once it was approved, they began to make large amounts of the drugs. So, you know, they only make a small amount to do the testing. But once it was approved, they did, they scaled up. And when they scaled up, they made a 50-50 of both the right and left-handed versions without knowing that they were doing that. The left-handed version helped to alleviate morning sickness. The problem is, is the right-handed version was teratogenic. So teratogenic means has the ability of causing birth defects. So when, you, when would you take this? You would take thalidomide when? You feel nauseous? In that you feel nauseous, but mostly during that first trimester. And during the first trimester, you're going from just a, a hundred cells to actually having a brain, a spinal cord, having a ventral body cavity, having an arms and legs. All of those things are formed and started during the first trimester. So thalidomide actually affected the formation, the elongation of arms and legs. So you ended up about 10,000 babies were born in the beginning of the 1950s that had severe limb deformations. So what happens is, is they ended up, their arms and leg buds didn't actually extend. So their little hands and feet were literally like on their shoulders and hips. So they never were able to walk, feed themselves, dress themselves. They basically had to have care for their entire lifetime. Many of them, had pelvic floor issues as well, just because that's where, like where everything was happening. So like the, the urogenital openings were all sort of mixed up and not correct. So all of them had, cha had challenges and ended up having to have care. Unfortunately, this didn't get picked up. So they released this drug. Women started taking it, took it in the first trimester, but then they're not gonna have these babies how long? until the end of that pregnancy. So six to seven months goes by before these babies are born. So it wasn't immediately connected back to thalidomide. They were just like, well, I don't know. We just seem to have like this like little run of babies that seem like they have some, some deformities in, at birth. It took a while for them to link back. It was all women that were taking thalidomide. So this drug actually stayed out on the market for about a year and a half. And it's all because of that, because there was this six month span between when women took it and when those babies were born. So it wasn't quickly connected. Only about 50% of those 10,000 survived. And out of those 50%, they had to have like lifelong care. They were never able to live independently, have jobs and, you know, because of those, the deformities. So because of this happened, this kind of like was a really big wake up call in understanding the structure of drugs, the structure of the pharmaceuticals. And so drug companies now 
they have to, as part of their application to get a drug, even into a clinical trial, they have to have the structure of it. And if there's any chiral carbons, they have to be able to synthesize all enantiomer forms and test all of them individually. In fact, thalidomide, they can produce the thalidomide that um, helps to alleviate morning sickness, but it has a very negative connotation, like history connected to it. The only time they lose, use thalidomide now is they will use just this form because they can specifically form one versus the other. They'll only produce the one form. They will not give it to women that might possibly be pregnant, and it's only used as an anti-nausea med for like cancer treatment. So that's just like most of the, the chiral carbons, one form works, the other one does nothing. But this was an example where one form works had a beneficial quality and the other one had a really detrimental quality. And so that led to a lot of regulations being worked up into the 1960s going forward so that all of these drugs end up having to be tested. Okay? All right, so that finishes four. So here is, there's a couple of practice pages at the bottom, okay? So what I will do with these, kind of like I did in chapter three. In chapter three, you, there was a number of PowerPoint slides that had questions that we didn't answer. I actually went through and answered them and they are posted in Moodle. Same thing with these. So this one, this one, and this one, I will go through and put the correct answers so that you can check them. Just so that you know, this is where I put them. So here, where it says Chem 130, 21, chapter four marked up PowerPoint, that is the PowerPoint with all of my notes. So if you wanna go back and practice them, you can. And if you're like, well, I want the blank pages, then just go up here. Here's your PowerPoints for printing. So you can download, download this chapter four active PowerPoint that has no answers on it. So you can actually go back and practice naming, practice like drawing, and then you can check it too. So you have, even if like there's any that we haven't answered specifically on your notes, I'll make sure that I have all of those filled out. So if you pull up the marked up PowerPoint, it'll have all of the answers. So that'd be a good way to practice there is, there's actually a couple, like here. So there's the exam to review. And then I did like a little checklist study guide. That is this that you can use as well. This checklist kind of gives you like a list of things. Can you draw Lewis stru dot structures for the main group elements? That's the first two columns and the last six columns. Do you know how to figure out how many dots go around? Hopefully you do. If you don't, you really got to start back at the beginning, okay? Can you identify ionic molecules from covalent, right? So ionic has a metal out front, covalent does not. Do you know how to determine the formula of an ionic compound from the name? So like if you have sodium chloride, can you figure out the formula? Can you do the opposite? Can you get be given the formula and can you tell me the name, right? So then transition metals, the Roman numeral part, so you could go back through that one. And if any of these you're like, then you should go find this in the PowerPoints, okay? So there's these ones that'll kind of like, can you make sure you can do those for chapter three? And then here's for chapter four, okay? About naming carbon chains by the number of carbons in the longest chain, about how to name non-hydrogen -hydro groups that are connected, numbering the chain, and then figuring out its final the final name Distinguishing between Lewis structures, condensed structures, and skeletal structures. We kind of did lots of those. Skeletals is the zigzag. Condensed tells you carbons with the hydrogens around. Okay, so all of these ones. So you can use these as ways to kind of check yourself off. But if you really want practice, like finish your mastering stuff, but good practices would be to go and find problems in the active PowerPoint, up in the PowerPoints for printing part. So go up here. There and you can do, use chapter three and four. The active PowerPoint has no notes added. The marked up PowerPoint in, is an exam two module and that has all of the answers. So there you've got like question and answer sets that you can use. Huh? Yeah, that's the PowerPoint for printing. Okay, so the PowerPoints for printing are the ones that I write on, but it has nothing yet. 
Okay, so that's what I start using at the beginning of each chapter. But then the ones that are in exam two modules, those are the ones with my notes. 